Our first reading this morning is from Psalms 37, 1 through 11, and 23 through 28. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light, and justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Yet a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land, and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Our steps are made firm by the Lord, when he delights in our way. Though we stumble, we shall not fall headlong, for the Lord holds us by the hand. I have been young, now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, or the children begging bread. They are ever giving liberally and lending, and her children become a blessing. Depart from evil and do good. You shall abide forever. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his faithful ones. The righteous shall be kept safe forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. Our second reading for today comes from the book of Acts. And we are partway through the book of Acts. This section happens just a little bit after Saul has had his experience in Damascus or on the way to Damascus uh, and had to sneak out of D Damascus and went off to Tarsus. And now let us listen to the next time that Paul shows up in our story. Um, Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 26. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that took place over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. And they spoke the word to no one except Jews. But among them were some men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who, on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, also proclaiming the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number became believers in turn to the Lord. News of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast devotion, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for an entire year they met with the church, and they taught a great many people, and it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. This is the word of the Lord. So this year, we've been invited by West Jersey Presbytery, which is the sort of regional body of Presbyterian churches, and, and a group of other churches in our area to be part of a, a program called Vital Congregations. It's a, a pilot program of the Presbyterian Church to strengthen congregations by focusing on the marks of vital congregations. That is what makes a congregation a thriving congregation, a spirit-filled congregation, and how we can all deepen our commitment to Christ. So we're doing this uh, by focusing on the marks of vital congregation. These are um, the things that you will see in congregations that are full of life, that are thriving. And they are lifelong discipleship, formation, intentional, authentic evangelism, outward incarnational focus, empowered servant leadership, spirit-inspired worship, caring relationships, and ecclesial health. There's seven marks that they've said, you know, 
When we look at the congregations that are thriving, that are vital, that are full of life, these marks are present in those congregations. And so if we want our congregations to be strengthened, to be vital, to be full of life, these are the things that we want to focus on as we do that. Now, I, I think that our congregation exhibits many of these, con of, of these con characteristics. I think I'm, I'm constantly amazed at the people of this church. I feel like I have the easiest job in the world because I, I just hang around my office and then all of the people in this church do this wonderful, incredible ministry of taking care of each other, of leading each other in faith, of supporting each other, of building caring relationships, of going out into the world and seeking to serve and save. And so I rejoice in the vitality of this church. But if we're not striving for excellence, if we're not constantly pushing ourselves to be a better congregation, to be a more thriving congregation, to do more, then often we are slipping backwards. And so I see this as an opportunity for us to emphasize the strengths that we have, to shore up the weaknesses that we have, and to all come together and grow and deepen our relationship with Jesus Christ by learning what it is that a thriving congregation does and how we might emphasize and strengthen those aspects of our ministry together. So, uh, to begin this, I'm going to introduce each of these concepts, there are seven of them, each of these concepts in worship with a, a sermon. It's going to take eight weeks because next week I'll be gone, I'm going to visit a new nephew. My brother just had a baby and we're overjoyed to go and see him. Uh, but I am, I'm very much looking forward to talking about each of these with you. And the first one that we're talking about today is lifelong discipleship formation. Becoming a great Christian doesn't happen by accident, and it's never over. Becoming a great Christian takes a great commitment. And like everything else in a faith that calls you at, at, its, at its greatest point to love God and love your neighbor, lifelong discipleship formation is about relationships. It's about who you know. There's a, there's a story that came out of the Depression and there's a reporter talking to a, a young man who had found a way to thrive and, and success. Uh, and, and the re reporter said, hey, you know, what, what happened? Tell me your story. He said, well, I found myself, I lost my job, and I found myself without anything but a nickel to my name. Um, and the reporter said, well, what did you do then? Well, I took that nickel and I bought an apple and I shined it up and I sold it for 10 cents. And then the reporter said, what did you do next? Well, I took that 10 cents and I bought two apples. And I shined them up and I sold them each for 10 cents. And, and then the reporter said, what would you do next? You could see where the story's going. This is going to be a great story to put in the newspaper. Um, and he said, well, then my father-in-law died and I inherited $50,000. <laughs> it's about who you know. <laughs> When, when it comes to lifelong discipleship formation, it is about the relationships that you have in your life, and the first relationship that you, that you need to have in your life is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the source of all that is good in our lives. He said, I am the true vine, and you are my branches. That is, Jesus is our, our root, our source of life and nutrition. And if we want to be lifelong disciples of Jesus Christ, we have to start by getting to know Jesus and by including that as a daily practice in our lives. If the branches aren't getting their nutrition from the vine, they wither away and die. And if we aren't getting our strength, our wisdom, our energy from Christ, our lives start to shrivel. Our lives start to get, get weaker. Our lives start to feel a little bit lost. And we find ourselves in those traps that are, that are so easy to fall into, that trap of busyness where we, we get on that treadmill and we run all day and we look down and we realize we haven't gone anywhere. Or that trap of uh, just going through the motions in a, in a life that we feel like we've done a thousand times before where nothing changes, nothing is different, and there's no source of newness of life, of creation in us. And when that happens, we often turn to something else, something else to try to bring that source of life into us 
But the truth is, everything other than Jesus is something that will, will have a cost. Whether it's money or status or drugs, we always pay for it in the end. But God's grace is free. And Christ strengthens us. We remember what Paul said in Philippians, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Christ turns our mourning into joy. If we stay connected to the vine, if we stay connected to Jesus, if we center our faith and our life around him, then our lives will flourish and bear good fruit. I had a friend who was in just a, he's a, a lay person, but just one of those amazing people on a, on a visit to somebody in the hospital or somebody who was homebound. He just had this incredible way about him. He could, he could walk into a room and sit down, and two minutes later, he asks one question, just one question, and all of a sudden, the person there has an opportunity to, to respond in a way that, and, and talk out the, the challenges of their life and find healing. It was, it was amazing. I, I used to love to, to go with them on visits, just, just to be in the presence of somebody who was so connected and who could, who could do that with somebody. That, that, that took me months of relationship building before I could ask that question. But, but he'd walk into a room and he would just say, and, and what is it that you're doing with your time now? And all of a sudden, you, you'd see them think, and you'd see them reshape the way they think. It was an amazing thing. And when I talked to him about his, his life, one of the things that he said was, I don't ever get out of bed until I've read my devotion. My book is right by my bed. It's, it's right there. And the rule is, my feet don't touch the floor until I've done my devotion. And, and after I heard that, I never had to ask, how it was that he could do what he did. Because I knew. He stayed connected to Jesus Christ. And by staying connected to Jesus Christ, he became a conduit of Jesus Christ through, throughout his life so that other people got connected through him. Now, staying connected to Christ is not the only relationship that we need for lifelong discipleship formation. Because when you think about the vine, and we're talking about grapevines here, when you think about the vine, the grape doesn't grow alone. It grows in a bunch. We need each other. We need to have relationships through which we grow and through which we help other people grow and through which we are held accountable. And Paul knew as well as anybody that life, that becoming a great Christian doesn't happen by accident. It's something that it, that it takes your whole life and your whole heart and soul and mind in order to do. Lifelong discipleship involves pursuing relationships that help us grow in our faith and then strengthen other people as they grow. You can't become a great Christian without help. When you think of all of the great Christians in the world and in history, the remarkable people who transformed the world, all of them had somebody walking with them, had a community that they came out of, none of them ever did it alone. And author Glenn McDonald talks about this in a book called Disciple Making Church. And he says, you need in your life a Barnabas, you need a Timothy, and you need an Antioch. You need a Barnabas. Wherever Paul traveled, he was mentored and guided by people who could lead him into a deeper face. And the first of these people that was Paul's mentor, that was Paul's guide, that was Paul's help, was Barnabas. He was a, an, an old believer. He'd been in Jerusalem for a long time. He got sent up to Antioch, Antioch, and he went to get Paul. And he went with, with Paul on a number of his missionary journeys. And, and he was Paul's wisdom. He was the one who helped Paul grow in his faith. He was the one who helped Paul stay faithful in hard times. He was the one who helped Paul uh, not go astray, not get lost in, in the chaos of doctrine. If you want to be a disciple of Christ, you need somebody in your life who will help you grow in faith. It doesn't need to be somebody older, because I think this is something that happens your whole life long, and you might get to a point where there's not anybody older. It just needs to be somebody who is helping you become a better follower of Jesus Christ. And it's got to be an active relationship. We, we, can't, we can't count, oh, I remember my, my youth leader. 
They were such an important person in my life, and now every year she sends me a Christmas card, and it's a delight to see how she's going. That doesn't count. It needs to be an active, ongoing relationship with somebody in your life that can help you grow in faith. When I was in, in high school, I, I had um, a prolonged period of difficulty and doubt in my life. And during that time, we moved to Texas, and so I, I was separated from uh, a lot of the people that I knew and, and could trust to talk about in faith. Um, and so I, I was just in a, a really difficult time. I couldn't sort myself out. And um, the people that I reached out to were, were closed off to me. And finally, we found our way to this church. It was a new church development. There was barely any people in there. We met in an elementary school. We set up all the chairs every week. We, we packed up our whole church and we put it on a trailer. And we drove it out to a parking lot at, at the end of service. Uh, and one day, Pastor Ken came and he said, Hey, Drew, I, I know we don't have a youth group because it's, it's just you and, and this other kid. But if you want, I'll sit down and have coffee with you. And so all my senior year, Pastor Ken drove down to, to my neighborhood, and at 7 a.m. every Wednesday morning, we sat down and had coffee. And those conversations were the most important, were, were some of the most important conversations of my life. He helped me sort out what it was that I believed. He helped me sort out what, what my relationship with, with the world was going to be, what my relationship with God was going to be. Uh, and and, if, and he was the first one to suggest that maybe I had a call to ministry. Those are incredible conversations to have in your life, and you need somebody in your life who can help you have those conversations. I know certainly I wouldn't be the person that I am today without Ken being my Barnabas during my senior year of high school. You need a Barnabas. You need somebody to help you learn and grow in your family. Second, you need a Timothy. Now Barnabas wasn't the only travel companion that Paul had. Everywhere that Paul went, he had somebody who was, who was helping him grow in faith. He had Barnabas and then Silas. And also, where he, wherever he went, he had somebody that he was helping grow in their faith. The first person he was with, the younger believer, was John Mark. Uh, but then the, the more famous uh, discipleship relationship that Paul had was Timothy. He had somebody in his life that he was helping to learn and grow. Timothy was a younger Christian, a newer Christian, who walked with him, and, and Paul helped him grow. And we need to have in our lives a Barnabas and a Timothy. We've got to have somebody that helps us grow in faith, but we also have to pass our faith on. Being a disciple of Christ isn't just a receiving relationship. It's a giving relationship to and having somebody who's walking with you in faith, they will ask questions that you didn't think about. They will insist that you explain things that, that you've just been trying to kind of cruise on, right? And they'll force you to think about things that you might not think about. And, and they'll ask you, or, or you'll want, to live out your convictions in a real way to show somebody how they can live in relationship. Being a disciple of Christ, we, we need somebody that we can help to shape and form. The, the great commission that Jesus gave us was go forth and make disciples of all nations. So part of being a disciple is making disciples. It's shaping and forming the new generation of people who will continue to carry this faith, who will, who will bear this holy treasure of the grace of God that we carry around with us. We need to have a Timothy. And finally, we need to have an Antioch. Antioch was Paul's home base. Antioch was, was the place where he could gather together with other Christians who had known him for a long enough time to call him out on his stuff. He needed somebody, he needed a group of people to help him be a faithful representative of Christ. He needed a home base. So that, that's why he spent time in Acts. He spent a year with Barnabas celebrating and teaching. And Antioch is this place that he returns to over and over and over again. He starts all of his missionary journeys out of Antioch. Because here is his community of believers. And we all need a community of people. It's not necessarily a, a big group of people. We need a group of people through which 
we can discern the will of God. Glenn McDonald makes this, makes this great observation. that when, when Paul wanted to hear from God, he doesn't just walk up and down the road to Damascus, waiting on Jesus to talk to him again. He knows that God talks to us in a myriad of ways, but the best way for us to hear and understand God's will is to be with other people who are trying to help us do it. And so all of us need a group of people that will help us hear the Word of God, that will hold us when we fall down, and hold us accountable when we walk, so that we can walk upright and tall and confidently in the grace of our Lord. And I can't think of a better example of, of an Antioch kind of community than the Presbyterian women in our church. They come together and they laugh with each other. They come together and they cry with each other. They support each other through the difficult times. They rejoice with each other through the successful times. They come together regularly for study and prayer. And it's in those communities that we are formed, that we are given the, the strength, the energy, the capability, that we discover the, the resources within ourselves and within our each other and within each other to go out and be the people that God calls us to be. You need and because we have all of these small groups of Presbyterian women, we have so many great leaders whose faithfulness shows us the way. All of us need a Barnabas, a Timothy, and an Antioch. We need somebody to learn from, somebody who's learning from us, and a community to hold us up when we fall, a community to hold us accountable when we try to get too big for our bridges. And we need a commitment to stay connected to Jesus in our daily life and practice. Ultimately, this is what discipleship formation is all about. It is about relationships. It's about our relationship with Christ. It's about our relationships with other people that help us and that we help to pursue deeper the discipleship to become formed, made into the image of Christ who is Discipleship is not something that just happens if we wait for it. It's something that needs to be pursued. A common, a great commission, a great Christian requires a great commitment. So as you go from this place, I want you to ask yourself, who in my life is my Barnabas? Who is helping me to grow in faithfulness? Who is helping me see how to become a better Christian? Who is my Timothy? Who is it that I am helping? Who is it that I am showing the way? How am I paving the road for the generation that comes after me? Who is my Timothy? And then where is my Antioch? Where is that group of people who are home? For me? Where is that, that, that place through which I can study, I can learn, I can grow, and I can seek in community to discern the will of God for me? And then pray that you will, in everything that you do, be connected to the Alpha and the Omega, the source of all that is living, Jesus Christ, who is our Redeemer. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit.